Parker, let them know I'm not going to teach long. Okay? All right. Hallelujah. Open them up if you would to Luke chapter 23. And we'll start in verse 44. Before that, if you've got a quick testimony, good. Again, it's good to have HD&D back from West Virginia. Amen. I know it's been snowing up there before when y'all went. This time it was, it did not. It can't be snowing in West Virginia in, in uh, what is this, April. You know, this time, uh, Saturday, I had to wear a jacket to go on a motorcycle ride here. And I sold it. It was 88 degrees here today, so... 21. I can't believe that. I figured you guys would walk right into the utopia of great weather. Amen. And there are other people that are traveling, amen, going out and doing things. Keith, we're having church tonight, man. Hey, I can see that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And again, we're glad to have our new equipment and we got a new PA. Sir, your testimonies you hear. Anybody else got a testimony? I mean, if you don't know where Keith come from and how far he's been, you'll realize what a testimony that is to have him in church today. Amen. Last uh, Sunday, we talked about, man, we just went through the whole cross, didn't we? Amen. We talked about his sayings on the cross and got all the way up to the, the finish line that he completed his mission. And that's what Easter was about, was about Jesus completing his mission. John chapter 1 uh, verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. Nothing was created without the Word. So the Word was Jesus. He's been here since the beginning. So when you read your Bibles, you'll pick up that John will say things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't. In a minute, I'm going to share with you. Luke, you know, when we finished in the book of John, and we talked about Jesus saying it's finished, and if you, all you're reading is John, you don't realize that Jesus shared one more statement after that. And from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock when he was on the cross for those six hours, you know, those last four statements came from 12 to 3, but some of them came very quickly. Amen. They were, they were like taking a breath and making a statement and, you know, releasing his mother and, and Father, forgive them. And then to the, to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So Luke chapter 23, verse 44, this is how Luke the physician, and remember, Luke's a little bit of a doctor. Amen. So you'll pick up, you know, I mentioned to you about bloody sweat. You remember that in Gethsemane where he had some sweat, drops of blood? Well, it was Luke that said that. Why would Luke say it? Because he's a doctor. He picked up on Jesus, the capillaries in his body popping when he was under the stress in the garden and said, not my will but thine be done. So this is the unique things about knowing these disciples and picking up on there. If I read your writings, you know, I, I pick on Sister Cheryl quite a bit. She's not here tonight, so I can pick on her. But, you know, if you've ever seen her writings, they're, they're quite, uh, she, I wish she'd write my sermons before I preached them. Because, man, she can, she can lay it out, you know. There ain't nothing I can say after because she just does such a good job. Uh, Marie's another one that can take words and put them together. Yeah, I got things back there in my office that you can read about sayings that I've made. They picked up on them. There's creativity there. So learn about me. If you text me, you get O. Okay, you get T-Y, uh, you might get a number because I missed the word and just put a number in. I'm not going to set, I, I remember one time I passed Dana on the road and she starts texting me. Well, I pulled over and called her. I can't, I can't answer all of this right here in a text with, with two letters. Hey, Amen. And, and then I got on to her for a while. Why are you texting me? Why are you driving? Hey, Amen. So, uh. Be careful with all that. You had a stop sign. Yeah, okay. Like a paragraph you sent me. Luke 23, verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour. So we're looking right at uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. So I'm sorry. So the sixth hour is 12 o'clock. The ninth hour is 3 o'clock. For the sun stopped shining. Now let's stop there just for a minute. Look at this. We read here that the darkness came over the whole land. But when we were preaching out of the book of John Sunday, when did darkness come? When Jesus said, I thirst. That's when the clouds gathered. Why is that? Because creation always wants to do the bidding of the creator. So when I'm reading this out of Luke, Luke don't mention the I thirst part here. But if we do know John said it and said when he said I thirst, the clouds gathered. So now we keep reading. The whole land until the ninth hour for the sun stopped shining. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, he doesn't mention the other part, but what was the other part to it? The dead 
got up and walked around, and the earthquake. So there are three things that took place. The curtain rent from top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom. The earthquakes took place. When he said, to tell us die, it is finished. And the third thing, those who were dead from long time. I want you to think about this. It could have been great, 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 great grandpa that got up out of the grave and walked around. And, and the scripture doesn't just... It just says this, un, this supernatural thing took place. It wasn't natural. And this is why sometimes I think you have to question science. You have to question it because science is always changing. Amen. And I know there are some science that is for real. Gravity is for real. We understand that. But there are certain things about science. They, they can't explain the dead getting up walking out of the grave. That's why a lot of scientists are agnostics, evolutionists, because they, they, it's hard for them. And to me, it's I'd have to have more faith to be a scientist than to be, be a believer in Christ. Because if I'm, if I'm uh, an evolutionist, i got to believe that we all evolved out of gases that got together. I mean, they can never explain where the gases came from and the one cell animal and over the millions of years. And, and if we've been evolving, why is it that we've only <laughs> made it this far in the last couple hundred years? Amen. This evolution is sure some slow stuff, isn't it? Amen. It had, it had, so anyway, and not to pick on it. You know I like to pick on it because it's it's just ignorance gone to seed. Uh, but until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then he goes on to say, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Amen. He, then he said this, he breathed his last. So this is the last say, and that's why I wanted to share it with you tonight. My message thought is releasing his right to life. This is hard. Uh, you know, if, if I'm 19, 20, 30, I, I, I don't even think about releasing my life. But now I'm 60, I think about releasing my right to life. Amen. Understanding that life is good. But Jesus was 33, and he released his right to life. In other words, I, I got life here, but I'm fixing to re release it. Luke is the only writer to record these words. And he uses them, and I want to break it down. He says, Father. And this is his, was his favorite title, amen, for God. It spoke of the intimate family relationship that had existed from eternity. But when you think about Father, and Jesus called him Father over and over again. And again, it's not trying to divide the Godhead or trying to figure out if Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or which one do you love the most. None of that. He just understood him as father. Now, we know the word was in the beginning. He was with God in the beginning. But when Jesus gets to earth, he uses the term father. And I love Abba. That is the a Greek word that you would use, Abba, Abba, A-B-B-A, -B -B -A. amen, Abba. The scripture says we receive the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Amen, and God adopted all of us. He didn't have no grandkids, but he has children. He adopted us into the family. So Abba becomes a very personal and I hear kids sometimes, they'll call a dad or a mom by their first name or, or maybe a pet name or something. But there's something precious about seeing the word dad for me, mom, amen. And when I, when I talk to my mama, I have never called my mama by her surname. What I mean by that, her first name. My mama will not even reveal to you her first name. She slapped you if you found out about her first name. She don't want. She don't like. You know, some folks don't like that first. They go by another name. So she always had. I'm not. You're not even gonna get it out of me after church because I ain't saying it. Amen. But his first word from the cross had been, "Father, forgive them." His last word from the cross, he bookended it with, "Father, into your hands I commit my spirit." But in between, he cried out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So understand this progression in his life. He, it was Father, okay, I understand where I'm going. But after a few hours on the cross, he excruciating and, and the sins of the world, amen, being poured on him, that agonizing moment when, when God himself turned his back on the Son, he bore the sins of the world, God forsaken by God. That's the only, the only way to look at it. It was God forsaken by God. But no longer Jesus died with the knowledge that the price had been fully paid. The cup had been empty. You remember he said, let this cup pass from me. But well, now the top, the foam, and the middle, and the dregs, it's all been emptied out. It's all been poured out. When he, when he said those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The burden has been borne. Estrangement ended. We were now connected with the Father. Whatever happened in those three mysterious hours of darkness is now in the past. Jesus yields his life to the one he called Father. Yes, he releases right to life.
Amen. He gave up his right to that. For 12 hours, Jesus has been in the hands of wicked men. Don't forget, it didn't just start on the cross. It started out through that night of all those um, mockeries of trials. And with their hands, they beat him. With their hands, they slapped him. With their hands, they abused him. With their hands, they crowned him with thorns. With their hands, they ripped out his beard. With their hands, they smashed him black and blue. They whipped his back until it was torn to bits. And all that behind him, Jesus says, now turns to his father's hands. I know what your hands did, but now I fix to give myself over to my Father's hands. So, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. I commit it. The word commit means is the word means to deposit something valuable in a safe place. It's what you do when you take your will and your most valuable possessions. Sir, it's where your guns are. Amen. Ma'am, it may be you too. Hallelujah. But they're in that, that safe deposit box. It's at the bank or it's stuck up in the house or you've got to hit somewhere. That's what that commit means. It ain't just throw it out there. I commit myself to a safe place with you, God. I commit my spirit. This phrase, Jesus meant his very life, his personal existence. Now that his physical life was over, he committed himself to his father. That's why I tell you that Jesus, uh, they didn't kill Jesus. I know that there was a book on who killed Jesus. The truth is, you could say the Romans murdered him. You could say the Jews conspired to do it. But the bottom line with Jesus, he gave up his life. And had he not, how much longer could he live? I don't know, but the issue for me is that he gave up the right to life. Amen. He said, you know what? I'm going to just let my life go right now at this moment. Father, I can no longer care for myself. I place myself in your good hands for safekeeping. The scripture talks about us doing that. For us to put our, uh, uh, that his grip, I use the phrase often, his grip don't slip. Amen. When you put your hand in his hand, he holds on to you, man. Amen. I'm telling you, there are times you pray, God, grab hold of my children. Amen, my grandkids, my friends, hold on to them. I need your grip, hold on, on to them, because nothing's stronger than your hand. Amen. Prophetically, Psalm 31, 5 says, Into your hands I commit my spirit, redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. So when I talk about in complete this mission, he knew they were verses. He knew there were words written in the Old Testament. Amen. And as he went to the cross, he began to fulfill them. Amen. He just began to lay them out there. He said, oh, yeah, let me make sure I get rid of Psalm 31, verse 5 here. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Amen. I'm going to, get, I'm going to make sure that it, there's no doubt. And this is the thing. People have doubts about what Jesus did. This book, this book is actually 5,000 years of known history. When I use the word known history, it messes some people up because they want to know about the millions of years and the dinosaurs. And, but, but known history that we know of. Amen. From Moses to, to, to Jesus himself up to the disciples. Here, here's the history book. And it's it's validated. It's validated by other books, validated. So I go back and I look at it. And when I, when I read Psalms, I say, look look what God did here. He he completed. Amen. It was, oh, what's his name? Lord, help me. I had a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Throw a big word at you. It's called apologetics. Apologetics is the art of defending the gospel. Paul did it in Colossians. He did it in Galatians. Apologetic. Not that you're apologizing, amen, but that you are learning to, and sometimes people say, well, how do you know it's true? So I had this book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I'm trying to think of the guy's name, man. I mean, Josh McDowell, that's right. And he wrote another book after that. But he uses a statement in there that for Jesus to fulfill all of the prophecies of the Old Testament in his life in the New Testament, in those few years, for him to do that would be like taking the state of Texas and filling it up to your knee with quarters. Now, you can imagine just if this room was filled with quarters up to your knee. But imagine the state of Texas filled up to your knees with quarters, paint one of the quarters red, and flip it out there somewhere between San Antonio and Austin, or Menard or Junction or El Paso. Just flip it out there in Texas. And then give you an opportunity, blindfold, to go pick it up. In other words, there ain't no way anyone else could ever fulfill everything that he did. Amen. And yet he did it. His physical suffering there reached the climax. The pain now is unbearable. He's, he's at the very end of his life. Breathing is almost impossible. The crowd gathers round. Again, they circle like vultures looking after prey. The friends of Jesus are watching in horror as his life begins to ebb away. That death rattle. I've been with a lot of people who have passed, and I can tell you there's there's a rattling that takes place when the when the air is is uh, at its end, 
and it's a, it's a, you just know it's going to happen. You know, there's no other way to look at it, and you it breaks your heart. But you know it. I can see Jesus with that death rattle in his voice and, and preparing. Amen. I can see devils excited. They're they're, they're fiendish. They that they're howling. I can see the angels look away. The Son of God is about to die, and it's by crucifixion. Death by crucifixion was in every sense of the word excruciating excruciating it's perfectly chosen word excruciating as a matter of fact because excruciating comes from the latin word excrucius which means out of the cross so when you say you're in excruciating pain you're saying you nailed down man amen that you, you you're having cramps and, and, and everything about your body is is pushing against you in other words let me be honest with you very few of us have ever been in excruciating pain but Jesus was at the cross in excruciating pain. And he gave up his life there. He was arrested, tried like a common criminal, beaten within an inch of his life, suffered the terrible ordeal of the crucifixion, and then he lays down his life. John chapter 10 tells us that this is what he came to do. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Don't, don't miss that because he knew it. I'm going to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So if you want to understand Jesus, understand the reason that the Father loved him is because of his obedience. He came and did what the Father told him to do. And he knew he was going to get back up. It still hurt. It was still excruciating. It was still pain. It perfectly matches the gospel's account of the death of Jesus in Matthew which tells us at the moment of his death, Jesus dismissed his spirit. I want to think about this. All right, spirit, you can go now. You know, I've taught you for years to live well. And over the last few years, I started turning a little bit to try to encourage you to die well. And this is the place where I look at Scripture and realize that one day we will see one each other again, that this is not all there is. Amen. And so many of us, you know, I, I'm, I'm going next week, prayer for not a week from, from today, I'll be heading up to Oklahoma City. I'll go to Bishop Miller's church to a conference there to be with family and to be with friends and pastors that I've connected with over the last 10, 12 years. But Bishop Miller won't be there. His residue will. Amen. His influence will still be there because he's such a part of that church. Amen. I'm hoping they'll show a little video clip of him every now and then because I go online. I miss him. Amen. I miss him. And I, I think of all the people that I know that have passed away. And I think this is not all there is. And I've got to live in such a way to learn to die well. You know, when I read what Jesus did, I can draw several applications here. When he cried out with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. First, he knew it was time to die. And again, I don't know if you'll get a heads up, but he knew it was time to die. Second, he wasn't afraid to die. This is going to be your hard part. Amen. Because fear just kind of grabs you at this moment because you've never been on the other side. Amen. You've never seen what it's like. He died with his life complete. When he finished, he was finished. Man, he, he did everything he came to do. Be, can I be honest with you? I don't know if any of us are going to feel like we completed our task. It's just we're always going to feel like something has been undone. Amen. That there's still one more pie to cook and one more pie to eat. Amen. There's always going to be something. One more fish to catch, James. There's always going to be something. And one more to cook. Hallelujah. There's always going to be something that we feel like we got to do. But Jesus completed. He died without anger or bitterness. That would be the big one. That I could die without being angry or without being bitter. Amen. About anybody in this life or, or any connection here. He died in complete control of his senses and his circumstances. Amen. When he laid down his spirit, he laid it down. He, the one scripture talked about his head. He just laid his head over. Amen. Hallelujah. He died knowing where he was going. Back to the Father's hands. Your confidence is so important. Your confidence is connected to your faith. And it works like an anchor of hope. And so whenever you have confidence that God's got you, you know, Joseph uh, got hold of me today. He said, Pastor, can we ride our motorcycles tonight? Well, my, I have confidence because I've watched him ride. So he's, he's picking it up. You get confidence through experience. But faith is also a powerful thing in your life. Amen. To believe God. Hallelujah. And to keep believing God. And to hang on. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Faith comes by hearing hear the word of God. The more I hear the word of God, the more faith wells up inside me. Then I have this hope. It's an anchor for my soul. The death of Jesus was a model of how faithful can you can face death. They're not afraid. They're not filled with remorse of over-wasted opportunities. They endure their portion with grace, knowing what a better day awaits the other side. You know, and I know some of you got 
got to get to a place in your life and say, Pastor, quit talking about death. Amen. But I can't help myself. Because when I first started pastoring, I very seldom dealt with it. You know, I was 25 when I preached my first funeral of a young teenager. I told you about it. Within the next few years, it seemed like all I did was uh, weddings. Then I started pastoring, and when you're young and you pastor, you pastor young people. But every now and then, somebody will get close. You remember Dorothy Howe? Got a message today from Donna, her daughter, her granddaughter. Got to return it. I just thought about this Dorothy. Gone on to be with the Lord. Amen. So these are folks from my... And then all of a sudden, I started doing funerals and realized, I better start learning something about this thing. Because people are dying, and I, 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 I'm walking up in the pulpit, and I don't have answers. So I started studying for answers. That's where Earth Soup came from. Amen. That's, that's where we'll all be 33 when we get to heaven. I can't prove it. You can't disprove it. Amen. I'm not going to be laid up in no convalescent bed or there won't be a nursery with little bitty babies in it. Amen. I'm, I'm believing God that, that he's got this thing figured out. Hallelujah. And if, and if you liked hair, you'll get it back. And if you're good with the way you are, you can keep it. Amen. I'm sure he's going to decide or help you decide that as you get closer up there. It, it, and a lot of that's not going to really matter, will it? Not really going to matter a whole lot. Amen. So Max Lucado, who I, who I really like Max's writings, he paints an unforgettable word picture of what Jesus' death was like, seen from the perspective of heaven, how heaven saw it. Amen. Father, the voice is hoarse, the rattle is there, the voice that called forth the dead, the voice that taught the will, and the voice that screamed at God. Now says, Father, Father, the two are one again. The abandoned is now found. The schism is now bridged. Father, he smiles weakly. It's over. It's over. Satan's vultures have been scattered. Hell's demons have been jailed. Death has been down. The sun is out. Yes, the sun is out. It's over. The angel sighs. A star wipes away a tear. Take me home. Yes, take me home. Take this prince to his king. Take this son to his father. Take this pilgrim to his home. He deserves a rest. Take me home. Come, 10,000 angels, come and take the wounded troubadour to the cradle of his father's arms. Farewell, manger's infant. Bless you, holy ambassador. Go home, death slayer. Rest well, sweet soldier. The battle is over. Amen. Amen. Joseph, you'd help me out here at the end. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. The, to free those who have all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. When I read this, I'm going to read it to you out of the message. I want you to catch it. Amen. Go ahead. Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on the flesh and blood in order to rescue them by his death. By embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold on death. And freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, okay, this is Paul writing in the book of Hebrews. And he's saying, you know, the truth of the matter is, people from the beginning of time have always been scared of death. They've always been scared of it. So he said he freed those who had cowered because of it, scared to death of death. It's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all this trouble for angels. You know, he loves you more than he loves his angels. Amen. When you die, you are not an angel. I don't know where that come up, but folks are going to get his wings. I don't need wings. I drink Red Bull here. Amen. You, you don't want to need wings when you get to heaven. Amen. Angels. Angels have those. He didn't go to all this trouble for angels. It was for people like us, children of Abraham. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Man, he entered into people's homes. He, he entered into to marriages. He, he entered into the, the death of children. He entered into disease. Amen. You just think about the areas that he entered into the temple. He just, he, he, he was in people's lives. Then when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself. Now, I, I don't know if you were raised up in a Catholic church or or a, perhaps a church where there was a priest and somebody was there and you have gone through life experiences and you tried to talk with them and they looked at you like, 
what are you talking about? I, I've never been through anything like that. You know, one of the great things in my life have been my experiences. So there are times when people talk with me, and I go, man, I've been there. Shoot, boy, I've, I've been there. I've been in that hospital. I've been there. You know why I go to the hospital? Because I was in the hospital. I remember being in there, being lonely, and nobody came by to see me. You know why I go to convalescent homes? Because I had family in convalescent homes, and so I'd go and see them. I wanted to visit the elderly and make sure they were fine. Yeah, you know why I get along with bikers? Because I are one. You know why I like cowboys? Because I could never ride like they could. But, man, I tried. I tried. I was hospitalized getting thrown off horses. Love gearheads, you know. Comes with a part of my background. So That's what Jesus is saying. He said, I came to earth, and I experienced your life. I experienced your failures. I, I didn't sin, but I experienced what you went through. I experienced hunger. You remember 40 days without food? I experienced it. I experienced temptation. I experienced uh, the heat of the desert. I experienced going without drink. I experienced being in a mountainside alone. I experienced betrayal and desertion. I experienced it. So let me be your priest. So when he stands before God, I mean, that's what he said. He would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where help was needed. So when you tell God, God, I don't know if you'll understand this, Jesus just laughs. <laughs> Are you serious? Man, I understand it. I understand it. That mess of disciples I had, they were a mess. I know what it was like, guys. It's just a thought. Just a thought that just came over me. Listen to me. When Satan is no more, death will be no more. When Satan's no more, death will be no more. Between now and then, you know, Satan still rules the realms of death. Men fear death with good reason. They're entering into a realm that Satan controls. But the death of what Jesus did, the death of Jesus spoiled Satan's power. He took away the power, the sting of the grave, of death, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And as long as men stay dead, death was Satan's ultimate tool to keep men in chains. But one man changed it all. When he came back to life, now listen, Jesus brought Lazarus back to life. Right? Jesus brought Jairus' daughter back to life. Jesus brought uh, the widow of Nain's son back to life. But nobody had ever brought themselves back to life. And there, my friend, was the, was the thing that busted hell wide open. Amen. When Jesus said, I lay down my life, but I'm taking my life up again. Amen. I, I'm going to be leaving here, but I'm coming back. I'm going to show you the power of God in my life. Hallelujah. And that's what messed everything up in hell. One man changed it all. He died, but he didn't stay dead. He broke Satan's power when he tore off the bars of death. Now, no one need fear any longer. Death still comes to all men and women. But for those who know Jesus, death has changed its character. It is no longer the entrance into the, a dim unknown. It's now a passageway. It's a transition portal from this life to the next. If we pass beyond that curtain, we're going to live on. Hallelujah. And it will not be as it was. Not with a halt, Jerry. Not with a limp, Jerry. Not with wrinkled brow. Not with dimming eyes or faltering steps. Not with twisted spine or runaway tumors. Not with bitter memories or faded dreams. Not with cancer or injured hearts. Not any of these. When we rise, we'll be clothed. By him, hands, he, we won't be made by anything other than him. So when I read this commending, we rise clothed in the shining mercy of God. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I close with what I started. It was now the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. But the sun stopped shining. The curtain of the temple was torn in two and Jesus called with a loud voice, Father, into your hands. Into your hands I... I commit my spirit. I release my right to life. Amen. I'm giving it up. And when he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, one of the Roman soldiers was there, seeing what had happened. One of those said, it could have been the one with a hammer in his hand that nailed his feet and his hands. He could have been the one with a rope that helped pull the cross up into the air when it fell into the ground. One of the centurions was there. And he praised God. 
He praised God on Golgotha's hill saying, surely this was a righteous man. I don't see the wrong here. Even look at this man. Surely he was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breast and they went away. You know what they understood? It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. He was innocent, but he gave up his life. Amen. He laid it down for me and you. Father, I thank you for the word of God. The more I read, the more I understand, the more faith builds up in me that you got a place for those who love you. We thank you, God, for the faithful, for those that care. We thank you, God, for this house. Lord, let us be a shining light to the Crosby community. God, I thank you for your mercies that were new this morning. I pray hope well up in every heart in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, give God praise in here. We should do that. <laughs> Sister Kim, I know there's a whole list of uh, announcements, and I, I just want the people online to see them also. Uh, so if there's a way to post them up there. But our Cubs are still going, my understanding, the Cubs are still going to Kentucky. Amen. And I don't know the wind that's going to be, if anybody knows. Amen. But April the 15th, there will be a garage sale here, the 15th through 17th, to raise, keep raising more and more money. Amen. And listen, guys, there is a opportunity for you to connect on, on when is it? June 26th is the date. Okay, well, just write that down. Keep that in mind. Amen. But the media crew, the Little Country Church media crew, is inviting everyone to join Facebook groups. And, and I'm not... The only reason I like Facebook is because it helps me connect with people that I haven't been connected to. Amen. I don't like uh, a lot of the advertising. I don't like all the politics of it. But it is a platform that I can use, and amen, and be able to connect with people. Uh, when I first really started using it, it was for my mother's sake, so my mom could see the kids and the grandkids and things of that nature. So, But Facebook has is, is become very easy. You can go to facebook.com slash live, be of holy wild. Click on groups. and there, there, Man, there's there's... There's all our groups are there, and they've already started posting. And they're, they're, I just, anytime they invite me, I just click yes. I'm joined. I'm joined in. That way I can be Snoopy, <laughs> find out what all going on out there. So whether it be one of the swap meets or the or, or Forge or, or or any of the the, the youth, Amen here or, or any of the kids groups or Bread Ministries. Or, or sis, you know, there's so many of them out there, ladies' ministry, and you connect with those, and you can stay connected. And that's what's so important. I asked uh, Bishop, it was Bishop Ron Eagleton hadn't had church in a year. I said, how did y'all, what'd you do? He said, we stayed connected online. We stayed connected online, and that's how, that was the only way we could do it. And so I think it's important for us to stay connected online, for you to look for that opportunity. Fields of Faith will go take place out in New Caney, it's a big ball field, so opportunity for the youth to get together, particularly out in the Montgomery County area, pray for them. Amen. There'll be a daddy-daughter dance May the 15th. Hallelujah. And then we start camp. June, we'll start camps, and we got 40, 50 kids coming per week. You know, nothing like we have had, but it's a start. We'll get to use the old buildings again, get things back up, the AC's rolling, and get things cleaned up, and just to be able to have camp, get back in the cafeteria and volunteer, do ropes course. So 1st of June, man, we got, those are the dates. That, that is, uh, I'm looking at one, two, three, four. That's, that's four camps right there. We, uh, that's not all. We got like eight camps coming this summer. So plus our own. We'll give you more about that. Kids summer camp July 14th through the 18th. So know that our kids will be having camp July 14th through the 18th. Would you stand with me? Yeah, that's right. The 12th through the 14th. I, actually, I was looking at the wrong date. It is the 12th through the 14th, July 12th through 14th. Thank you for the correction. Keep me straight. That's what y'all do. Amen. Guys, good to have y'all out here tonight. Thanks for coming out. Love you. Got you out plenty of time. Amen. I like starting at 7. But, man, traffic is crazy. Crazy. Especially if you're coming from New Caney to here. And it was all right until I hit Crosby. And it's like, come on. Amen. But when we get that four-lane finish, it's going to be nice. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Be kind. Those watching online, join us Sunday online again or come here to the house at 830. Love you guys. Amen.